Hi, welcome to a lecture on rectangular patch antennas. This is part two of a multi-part lecture. In part one, I talked about the general principles of operation, polarization, and pattern. In this part, I'll address design, including issues of impedance, bandwidth, and a few other important matters. Here's a reminder of what we're talking about. The antenna consists of a rectangular patch implemented on a printed circuit board. The printed circuit board consists of the patch on the top layer, a dielectric substrate, and a ground plane. The dielectric is characterized by a relative permittivity, epsilon sub r, and the dielectric has thickness t, which is tiny relative to a wavelength. Also, we'll assume the dielectric is lossless. As in part one, we'll feed the patch using a microstrip transmission line connected to the center of one side of the patch. The dimensions capital L and capital W are shown in the figure. As in part one, we choose L to make the patch half wave resonant, and we're using the edge fed method resulting in linear polarization. In part one, we did not address how to select W. In this lecture, we'll see that W determines radiation resistance and, combined with L, also the bandwidth and the radiation efficiency. The agenda for this presentation is to discuss a design strategy for choosing the dimensions of the patch. This requires that we talk a bit about how W sets radiation efficiency and the impedance and the bandwidth. Finally, we'll talk about how specifically to set L. Of course, L needs to be one half wavelength but what we really need to know is how to determine exactly what a wavelength is for this particular structure. As before, the material in this lecture comes primarily from the two most popular general antenna textbooks, namely Stutzman and Thiel and uh, Blanus. And again, I'll warn you that different authors have different views on the process of analysis and design of patch antennas. The differences in approach including differences in the uses of terminology and variables, can be daunting. As before, I'll try to stick to the minimum number of concepts and results that seem to get the job done, and which I think everyone agrees on. Here's a summary of the design process that I have in mind. We enter from the left, and we ask the question, what is our primary concern? If we wish to optimize radiation efficiency, that is epsilon sub rad, then we follow the top path. Radiation efficiency is determined by W, as I'll explain in the next slide. Once we have W, then we calculate L, which requires accounting for the radiating fringing fields. After that, one will normally choose a feed and then enter into an interactive process that requires some combination of electromagnetic simulation. That's what I'm calling full wave solver here in the flowchart. Uh, and or uh, measurements. The purpose of the iterative final step is to improve our final choices for W and L, accounting for all the things that we've neglected to that point, including in particular the effect of the feed. Now sometimes the primary concern is not radiation efficiency, but rather impedance or bandwidth. In that case we follow the bottom path through the flowchart. Impedance and bandwidth both depend on L as well as W, so the first step is to find an initial value for L that will not be very accurate, but will at least allow us to continue. In fact, our initial guess for L will be to say that it is a little bit less than one half wavelength in a homogeneous dielectric space that has the same relative permittivity as the PCB substrate. We use 0.49 as opposed to 1 half in the expression as a crude way to account for the effect of fringing fields of the patch, which generally reduce L. Once we have L and W, then the procedure is the same as before, that is, refine L, choose a feed, and then iterate. In the remainder of this presentation, we'll address the additional details needed to perform this process. So, if your goal is to maximize radiation efficiency, the expression shown here will tell you how to choose W. This expression is telling you to choose W to be one half wavelength for a homogeneous dielectric that has a relative permittivity, 
That is the average of free space, that is one, and the relative permittivity of the PCB substrate, that is epsilon sub r. The derivation of this expression is beyond the scope of this lecture, but those interested can certainly find out more in the references that I suggested earlier. An important thing is to know that this is an approximate expression, so don't be surprised if you find out later that you're off by tens of percent. Again, this is why we need that final step of iteration in the design process. Finally, note that we do not actually know what the radiation efficiency will be. We can only have some idea that we will be close to the maximum if we choose the value of W suggested by this equation. The best way to calculate the radiation efficiency is, at least in my opinion, simply to wait and calculate it in the final step using either simulation or measurement. It's possible to estimate the impedance of a rectangular patch using the expression shown here. First, remember that the topic of this lecture is half-wave resonant patches, so the imaginary part of the impedance will be approximately zero. So, all that's left to figure out is the real part of the impedance, that is R sub A. Also, this is the impedance for the edge-fed technique that we assumed at the beginning of this lecture. We'll address the impedance for other phi techniques in a later lecture. Also, once again, note that we have an approximate expression, so don't be surprised if you're off by tens of percent. Nevertheless, this expression can give you a pretty good idea of how R sub A is determined by W, L, and the dielectric constant. In particular, we see that R sub A increases with increasing dielectric constant, and we see that it decreases in proportion to the ratio of W to L. The table in the upper right shows how this plays out for a few representative examples. Generally, one finds that patches that are approximately square, that is, with W over L close to 1, these tend to have R sub A on the order of hundreds of ohms. Now, if you're after 50 ohms, you can do this by increasing W over L, but note that W over L needs to be huge to get to 50 ohms. Generally, a better strategy, if you really do need 50 ohms, is to use quarter wave transmission line matching or to use a different feed technique. It's possible to estimate the bandwidth of a rectangular patch antenna using the expression shown here. What we have here specifically is fractional bandwidth, which is bandwidth in hertz divided by frequency in hertz. So, for example, 10 megahertz bandwidth around a frequency of 1000 megahertz is 0 0.01 fractional bandwidth, or as we might say, 1% fractional bandwidth. Further, note that bandwidth here is defined with respect to the voltage standing wave ratio. Specifically, bandwidth here is the frequency range over which the voltage standing wave ratio will be 2 to 1 or better with respect to a fixed feed impedance. Yet again, note that we have an approximate expression, and don't be surprised if you find later that you're off by tens of percent. Nevertheless, this expression can give you a pretty good idea of how bandwidth is determined by W, L, and the PCB parameters. In particular, we see that bandwidth decreases with increasing dielectric constant. And we also see that bandwidth increases in proportion to W over L and substrate thickness. The table in the upper right shows how this plays out for a few representative examples. We see that patches are going to have bandwidths on the order of a few percent, as I mentioned briefly in the part one video. Now we turn our attention to the problem of how to find L given W and the PCB parameters. Recall that L should be whatever length results in half-wave resonance, so it seems like this should be easy. The problem is that the fringing fields make it hard to know exactly where this resonance occurs. The approach we'll use here is borrowed from microstrip transmission line theory. What we'll do is first calculate an effective relative permittivity that would yield the observed phase velocity in an infinite homogeneous medium. Then we'll use this to calculate a length correction that accounts for the special characteristics of the fringing fields of the resonant rectangular patch. The expression shown here is what we'll use for effective relative permittivity.
Now, first, a warning. Note that factor of 12 times t in the expression. Some references will indicate that to be 10 times t, which I believe is incorrect and based on confusion between this and a more general form of this equation. Suffice it to say, I recommend you use 12t as opposed to 10t, and be advised that the difference, should you choose unwisely, can be surprisingly large. Also, be warned that this, surprise, surprise, is an approximation and becomes invalid for PCB thicknesses greater than about 0.02 wavelengths. If you find yourself on the wrong side of that threshold, better expressions exist, but of course they're more complicated. Once you have relative permittivity, you can estimate the desired value of L as shown here. Here the quantity delta L is an estimate of the length of the radiating fringing field on one edge of the patch. So, the length you want is one half wavelength of the dielectric minus two times delta L since there are two rows of radiating currents to account for. The expression for delta L is empirically derived, that is, it's a fit to data, so there's not too much to interpret there. Generally, you're going to find that delta L can range from less than 1% to as large as tens of percent of the length L. So, once you have candidate values of L and W, the next step is to select a feed. If you intend to feed the patch using the edge-fed technique, then there's nothing else to do. If you intend to use some other method, then you need to figure that out, which is a topic for another lecture. Common reasons for changing the feed method are because you want to change the impedance, or you want circular polarization as opposed to linear polarization, or you need a technique that gets the feed line off the top layer of the PCB. Regardless, the final step of design is using electromagnetic simulation or measurements to confirm and, if necessary, refine the design. This is important since there is, as we have seen, a lot of approximation in the design process. One final note I will make here is that sometimes it's of interest to design for a particular beam width or directivity. With what you know now, combined with part one, you should be in a position to do that if you'd like. I'll wrap up this lecture with a common and important question. Why not just use software to do this? For sure, there exists RF computer-aided design software which will inhale your design requirements and exhale a design. I think there are four reasons why this might not be the quick answer that you hope for. First, software doesn't really know anything more profound than I've just shown you, so there's often an iteration phase at the design process no matter what, even if the software designs the patch for you. What you're going to need to come up with at that point is a plan for how to iterate the design. For example, if you really need to kick the bandwidth up a little, you could do this by increasing the ratio of W to L, as we've seen already. And you now have a pretty good idea of how much it needs to increase from the expression that I gave you. Well, then the role of the software is for checking the new design. If we think about higher level engineering processes for a moment, there are more reasons why software is not likely to give you a complete solution to the problem of patch intended design. For example, it's fairly common to be confronted by someone else's design and be asked to change it somehow. Again, if you understand the first pass design procedure as I presented it here, this is a pretty straightforward task. Uh, if you don't understand that first pass pr design procedure, there's probably gonna be a lot of guesswork. Another situation is having to quickly estimate the characteristics of a patch antenna that you encounter in the wild. It's not always the best use of your valuable time to collect a bunch of measurements on a patch antenna that you come across and then enter them into a computer program and then run the program. Especially when all you really need to do is just get those measurements and try them out in the equations that I've already shown here. Finally, I'll point out that there are a few times when you need to do something really creative and unusual. You're more likely to have good ideas if you understand what is going on, and otherwise you're going to be facing a lot more guesswork and most likely some dead-end solutions. That concludes part two. Thanks for listening.